A UN report seeking an international criminal court investigation into Sri Lanka is being discussed today at a meeting in Geneva. The report by the UN's top human rights official, Michel Bachelet, also calls for sanctions against top Sri Lankan officials accused of war crimes. The report accuses the government of Sri Lankan President Gotabaya Rajapaksha of clamping down on democracy in the country and not bringing to book people responsible for rights violations during Sri Lanka's decades-long civil war. For 26 years, Tamil separatists battled the Sri Lankan government for a separate state. The war ended in 2009 with the defeat of the rebels. But it also left significant casualties among the civilian population. For many of the Tamils who lost loved ones, the search for accountability has made little progress. This is the number of days these mothers have been protesting. For four years, they've stood on the side of the road in the town of Vavayunia, in the north of Sri Lanka. The women want to know where their children and husbands are. They've been missing since the end of the civil war in 2009. Jayawanita Kasipalai has also been here every day for four years. She's looking for her daughter. We need each other. My suffering is also felt by these other mothers. Because of that, I keep on fighting, not only for my child, but for all the children and husbands who went missing. We have to find out what happened to our children. All these mothers believe that their children and loved ones will return. They can't lose their hope. The 52-year-old says she recognized her daughter in this photo from 2015. It apparently shows the girl standing next to former Sri Lankan president, Matripala Sena. Seeing the photo spurred her to initiate the mother's protest. The family belongs to the Tamil minority. During the last days of the civil war, they were forced to leave their home and were taken to a camp run by Sri Lanka's secret service and interrogated. On the way, Jayawanita Kasipillai says her daughter was kidnapped, by whom is unclear. Shortly before the end of the civil war in 2009, the Sri Lankan army combed Tamil territory. The soldiers were looking for fighters from the Tamil Tiger Liberation Organization, or LTTE, who were fighting for independence. According to the UN, both warring parties committed serious war crimes. Up to 15,000 Tamils are officially missing, though the United Nations believes the number to be much higher. It has been impossible for this family to find peace since their eldest child disappeared. They've been to the police time and again, and even called on the UN Refugee Agency and the UN Human Rights Commission to get involved, but in vain. It's very difficult now that my wife stays in Vanuvania at the protest site, but I'm with her in thought all the time. And I keep telling my wife to bring our daughter home. I'm convinced that my daughter is still alive. Protests by Sri Lanka's Tamils are growing. Thousands took to the streets for three days in early February, demanding the government clarify what happened to the countless missing. Sri Lanka's current president, Gotabaya Rajapaksa, declared all missing persons deceased in 2020, including the daughter of Jayawanita Kasapalai. Rajapaksa was the defense minister during the civil war. The UN Commissioner for Human Rights lays the blame for alleged atrocities committed during that war on Rajapaksa's current army chief. <coughs> the women simply want to know what happened to their children. So far, no Sri Lankan government has offered to help them. And for some perspective on this, I'm joined now from Colombo by Ambika Satkunanathan, a former member of the Human Rights Commission of Sri Lanka. Welcome, Ambika. Why is it so hard for victims of a civil war that tore the country apart to get any justice? Well, I think it's uh, difficult for the victims to get any justice because this government in particular denies that there was even an ethnic conflict. Hence, the root causes of, those con of the conflict have still not been addressed. And uh, the victims uh, cannot find justice. For instance, uh, we have a, a number of people who have disappeared, forcibly disappeared. The government now says that those people were all part of the LTT, and hence, under international humanitarian law, their deaths are justified. Hence, there is a culture of denial and a culture of impunity. In this context, victims find it very difficult to have their voices even heard, let alone actually you know, uh, get truth and justice. 
Now, Human Rights Commissioner uh, Michelle Bachelet says in her report that events over the past year in Sri Lanka have, quote, eroded democratic checks and balances and civic space and reprised a dangerous exclusionary and majoritarian discourse. Is she right? She is. I mean, I'm sad to say, but she is right, because we have, we have seen since the election of the new government in November 2019 is a concentration of power in the executive. We have seen the 20th Amendment to the Constitution, which also uh, has provisions which undermine the independence of the judiciary uh, and also undermine, undermine the independence of the uh, let's say, the Human Rights Commission. Uh, in addition, we also see rapid militarization. There is shrinking of civic space, particularly in the conflict-affected North and the East, where civil society organizations are subject to surveillance, intimidation, and harassment by uh, security agencies. We find people are self-censoring, and there is a, a climate of fear that if you are critical of the government, there might right. be reprisals, or you will be called a traitor or international. No. We are talking about a country, Ambika, that has emerged from more than two decades of civil war. The kinds of things you are describing should apparently be the, exactly the kinds of things that a government should avoid. And therefore, I wonder, why is the government of Gotavia Rajapaksha pursuing this agenda? I mean, that's a very good question. And I think it goes to the fact that historically we have had a majoritarian state. Uh, and of course, now more so, this government in particular practices ethno-nationalist politics. And I think they do not view the minorities or the numerical minorities, the Tamils and the Muslims, as equal citizens. And hence, uh, there is, in a way, you can find contempt, like the forced cremations of uh, Muslims who have died of COVID. In that climate, to them, in according to their ethos, values and strategies, I suppose this would make total sense. Do you think there is a danger, Ambika, that this sort of an agenda from the government could give rise to a new cycle of violence in the country? I think this kind of intolerance, discrimination is what led to the, the ethnic conflict that we had. We suffered with it for like 30 years. The root causes have still not been addressed. We also uh, can find this is the kind of intolerance, uh, bigotry and discrimination that can lead to radicalization of the youth. In that context, we have COVID, we have severe economic uh, hardships that people are facing at the moment. I think all that is a recipe for definitely more, more violence in society and potentially down the line, uh, perhaps another conflict. Uh, Amika, Michelle Bachelet has called for international action, including targeted sanctions and uh, taking the matter to the International Criminal Court. Are those the only avenues left to achieve reconciliation and uh, human rights accountability in Sri Lanka? I would say right now, yes, because uh, domestically there is a culture of denial, as I said, and they feel that there is nothing to even deal with. There is no need to deal with the past. Uh, so there are no domestic remedies that the victims can access. Although I know very well that the international uh, mechanism is, uh, you know, uh, faulty and it's not perfect. Right now for the victims, that is the only option they have in their long march towards truth and justice. Ambika Satkunathan, we'll leave it there for the time being, but thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.